Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message and if you have any feedback you'd like to offer feel free to give me a call at 207-364-3856 or my cell phone 207-357-4748. Again, enjoy today's message. Thanks. It would be worth it to me, church. It would be worth it, you know, to, uh, to, to, you know, I know it looks like more busy, more events, all this kinds of stuff. And, and God has us, though, in the front lines to preach and teach the good news. And God is moving, and lives are being changed, souls are being saved. The adversary, he's, so, he's showing his ugly head, too, which is to be expected when it comes to the moving of God. The adversary is not just going to sit by and let it happen. He's going to try to show himself, but God is going to be victorious because he is victorious. We just sing about victory in Jesus, amen? We just sang about it, praise the Lord. So we win, praise be to God. The Bible declares, and, and I'm excited about it, praise God. But if there was any week that Christians needed to get excited about, it's Resurrection Week. I can't think of another week in the calendar that we should be more excited about than the events leading up to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. How many of you tonight came for the Word of God? Praise be to God. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I like that. We're ready to, we're ready to roll. Well, to title, the title of tonight's message is, Do You Understand Palm Sunday? Do you understand what this Sunday is all about? Now, do you, now, this morning we preached on it from Matthew's account of the gospel. Tonight we're going to look from John's account of the gospel. But this is so much more, church, than just an opportunity for you to get a little branch that tickles your nose. This is a, I'm serious, this is an event that signifies the deity of Christ, as we talked about this morning, but it leads us into the events of the last week of his life. Think about a loved one that you know and cherish who has passed away. And think about the last week of their life and what they went through. You know, and the different things that happened and the ups and downs. And Laura, if I could be so kind as to use your husband, Billy, because Billy and I were so close. I still wear a pair of pajamas that that brother gave me. He wanted me to have them, and I still wear them. Him and I were close, and we had been through a lot. But the last week of his life was, I mean, he had, he had an up. You know, he was doing better. He was, and, uh, and his last words he said to me before he went into the sickness and the Lord was taking him home was he told me he loved me. You know, and it was amazing. I'll just never forget the, the time spent in the building that relationship and what God had, had saved his soul and washed away his sin and, and, and all those things that, that went on. And, and next thing you know, though, we thought, I thought he was getting better. I thought, man, we were talking about coming to church again. You know, we were, I mean, he was, he, and, and then the Laura called me. I'll never forget when she called me and said, Pastor, uh, he's, he's slipping. And I said, Laura, I don't understand. He just told me he loved me. He just told me he was, he was doing so much better. And the doctors were getting hopeful that things were improving. But the Lord called her home. Remember, the Lord knows the numbers of our days. And I was thinking about that in preparing this message tonight. How, you know, the Lord, it looks like, this looked like a high. This is Jesus fulfilling prophecy. This is Jesus, you know, who's proving his deity. And things would change like that. Things would change on the dime. And that's what happened with Laura's husband, Millie. And, 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 and I know you guys have your stories, too, of loved ones that you know. You know, in the last week of their life, how things can change very quickly. And we have to be ready should the Lord call us home at any time. But I want everyone to understand that the events, the last week of Jesus' life before he died on the cross and was resurrected, they happened very quickly. This is, a, this is a very much a high event Palm Sunday. You know, it's the introduction to Resurrection Week. But things are going to change very fast because there was something happening below the surface. Sometimes what we see on the surface is not what's happening down in the roots, down below the surface. And, and this, is, this is a matter of life and death that we grasp what's going on. It's a matter of where one will spend eternity. It's a matter of how we will worship, whether it will be worship in spirit and in truth, or whether it will be worship that is superficial and just on Sunday. One thing I love about Sunday night is where you get folks that come in and just want more of the Lord, that want to just come in and lift up the name of Jesus, and you can just tell God's presence is here, and you can tell because why the worship is very genuine out there. 
Well, you know, you could easily say, well, Pastor, I was in your house this morning. I was in God's house this morning, so I'll, I'll stay at home and watch the, the Red Sox and Yankees tonight. They're going to be game in New York, game three of the series tonight. You know, I, I just want to sit home and watch that. You know, but, but you can tell because of God's presence. He inhabits the praise of his people. And I'll tell you what, church, if you look closely enough, you can tell, too, worship that is not sincere, just as we talked about this morning. But things can happen fast. You can see someone praising the Lord, and it's like they're this close to Jesus, and the next day you see a post on Facebook that they blasphemed. That's how things can happen. Okay? And this is no different than Palm Sunday, the day in which we are celebrating here today and around the world. If you guys would be so kind as to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. And we're going to be looking at John chapter 12. And we're going to pick up with verse 12 here tonight. John chapter 12, beginning uh, with verse 12. Here tonight, and we're going to read down through verse 26. And we may go a little further, depending on how the Lord leads. But I want us to look at 12 to 26 here tonight of John's Gospel, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. The next day, a great multitude had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he found a young donkey, sat on it as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him, because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said amongst themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the word has gone, the world has gone after him. Now when a certain now there were certain Greeks among those who came to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life for this world will keep it for eternal life. And if anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will, also, will be also. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Church, again tonight, we're going to get real serious with God. People ask all the time, why do we stand for the reading of God's word? We stand out of reverence for his authority and reverence for his word. And I believe if there's anyone here that is physically able to stand, and if they can, at least attempt to stand as long as possible for the reverence of God's Word. Do you know that there are places in this world that only have pages of the Bible, and they would love to have a complete 66-book Bible? Church, we are blessed. We have the complete Word of God, and I believe the least that we can do is stand for the reading of God's Word out of reverence for Him. Remember who is the Word? Jesus is the Word. Praise the Lord. Well, as we look at John's account, as we break this down, it's real important that everyone have a desire to have a full understanding of what Palm Sunday is all about. I'm serious, as I said this morning, it breaks my heart that, that Christians, even evangelical Christians, or what we would call disciples, you know, lack the understanding of what Palm Sunday really is. And I, I know with my Sunday school class and with the children that I talk to today, and not just with kid time, but talking to them after church, really wanting them to understand this is more than just a toy to tickle each other with. This is something that is symbolic of what took place in the last week of our Lord's life 2,000 years ago. 
And every year, church, we want to learn more. We want God's Word to come alive uh, through, this, through this week. And as I said, we're already planning for 2015, should the Lord tarry. You know that March 29th is Palm Sunday next year, and April 5th is Resurrection Sunday. And that's going to be our spring crusade. It's real important to me that each person, even our children, even our teenagers, have an understanding of what went on 2,000 years ago. But we're going to look at this tonight from John's perspective, which John gives us a little more insight or additional insight than Matthew gave us as we read here this morning. And so we're going to look at John's perspective here as we break down these verses. I pray that God's Holy Spirit will begin to penetrate deep into your soul because this is going to determine your value of discipleship. How much of a desire do you have in following after Jesus Christ? Now, of course, in the last week of one's life, Jesus, as we just read, he knew that his hour was about to end. His hour was at hand in which he would die. Just as many people who are struggling physically, and I've worked with many of them and had the great honor of, of performing their, their funeral, and many people who know that death is upon them and that they're getting ready to go on to be with the Lord, I really cherish that time because the strength that they have and the words that they say are very important. We don't go in and talk about sports. We don't have, there's no breath for that. We're talking about things that are life and death, things that are heavenly, things that are going to, uh, you know, things of great value, you know, things that are going to be cherished forever because you can't use your breath on other things because it may be your last breath. Jesus is going to give us a lot of insight on what's really important in life and what is not. And discipleship as a believer of Jesus Christ is very important for us to know and to understand. Verse number 12 of John chapter 12. The next day, so we go from Saturday to Sunday morning. We go into uh, where Jesus has, has just talked about, or Jesus had just, the anointing at Bethany had just took place. The plot to kill Jesus was developing. Things were happening. Lazarus was just raised from the dead shortly before this. People say, didn't Jesus do that at the beginning of his ministry? No, he raised Lazarus at the end of his ministry before he was about to be raised up himself by the power of the resurrection of his holy father in heaven. But church, you know, so here's the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast. We talked about that great multitude this morning. We know that Passover is taking place. We know that, you know, these different events that are happening that we talked about and we will talk talk about this week, especially on Wednesday night, you know, that they were there, they had come to this feast, and they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Now, if you add that to what Matthew had already told us, that the, that the crowd was gathering, they were in front of Jesus, behind Jesus, to the left and right of Jesus. Jesus had a, a crowd that was gathering around him, and here this crowd, verse 13, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. This is where John, Matthew just talked about, they took branches. John tells us what kind of branches they took, which is where we get Palm Sunday from. Okay, so took palm tree, uh, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, Jesus, and cried out, Hosanna, which means saved now, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. This again is Psalm 118 prophecy that is being fulfilled as John is recording it, you know, and so they're shouting Hosanna. Jesus is riding in on the colt of a donkey, you know, and, and Jesus is being praised and he is letting this praise take place. And so this morning we learned that this praise was was just on the outside. It was not in the depths of their heart. It was not genuine. And just four and a half days later, many of these same people would be shouting, crucify him. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, fear not, verse 15, a daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now, of course, this is Zechariah 9, 9. Uh, Zachari uh, John gives us a lot of the same information here. Uh, he's not as detailed. Verse 16, <coughs> we're going to get into the meat of the difference and having an understanding of Palm Sunday as we, as we get into the response of the disciples. You know, but that prophecy is being fulfilled that Zechariah had given for, I'm uh, sorry, 600 years prior to the birth of Christ and death of Christ on the cross. Okay, and Jesus had found the donkey. He sat on it, and, and they began to uh, sh uh, shout Hosanna. And, of course, the Lord declares, uh, you know, there in verse 15, Fear not, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And that prophecy was fulfilled. But let's transition into something new that John gives to us 
that Matthew did not. Verse 16, his disciples did not understand these things at first. Church, understanding is really important. We're learning that on Wednesday nights with Proverbs class. It's one thing just to have the knowledge. It's one thing to have the wisdom. But the understanding, which means you apply it to your life. You grasp it to where you go from just the knowledge piece to the application piece. Here at church, they did not understand what was going on. They were not putting the pieces together. They had had the knowledge. Jesus had been telling them numerous times that he would die. Jesus had been telling them that he would be resurrected again. Remember the disciples that by this point had spent three years with Jesus Christ. Three years with him, listening to him. But they did not understand what was taking place. Church, when I think about the prophecy that is being fulfilled right now in the last days. And that Jesus Christ could literally come back at any time. I wonder how many Christians really understand that. We've taught it twice through prophecy here in the last days. Uh, since 2008, we spend a lot of time trying to warn people and explain the signs of the time so that they have an understanding of what's going on. You know, understanding is very important. It's not just enough to say, go see the pastor or go see Mary or go see the ministry team or go look it up on the Internet or pull out your phone and say, well, I'll Google it and see. Church, that's not cutting it. We have to have the understanding down in here, down in our hearts. And we have to live that if we want that genuine worship, that genuine knowledge, that genuine wisdom and application to our life. They did not understand at first. Verse 16 continues and says, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things were written about him and that they, and that they had done these things to him. And so they remembered later on. Now, John, of course, is kind of referring back. Church, sometimes it's going to be too late. Sometimes, you know, we have to seize the opportunity. We have to seize things that are at hand. We just can't, like, for example, those that are left behind, you know, believers that turn away from their faith, they can't sit back and say, oh, I remember Pastor saying that, that I could walk away from my faith and I could, I could uh, disown or blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Even the elect are going to fall away. By then it's going to be too late. Now, praise the Lord, the disciples are going to have an opportunity to get their stuff together. And they, of course, do at Pentecost or after Jesus ascended, and especially after Pentecost, which, which is, by the way, uh, in June, uh, June the 8th this year, okay, uh, 2014. But they did not understand at the moment. Church, do we understand now, not five years from now? Don't sit back and say, well, I'll, I'll learn about it five years from now. I'll learn about it when I turn 50. I'll learn about it when I turn 60, or I'll learn about it. Young people, don't say, well, I'll worry about it when I become an adult. Have an understanding today. Have an understanding of what is going on today and the deity of Christ and what's taking place. Don't wait till later because it might be too late. And sometimes you don't know what you got till it's gone. Amen? And so we have to seize the opportunity. And we're doing all we can here at Praise to get the knowledge and the wisdom to you. And I pray that you guys have the understanding or the application for now. In your relationships, uh, in, your, in your work, in your school, have this practical knowledge, you know, so that you can be used of God for such a time as this. How many of you want to be used by God Resurrection Week? You've got to be equipped. You've got to have the knowledge. You've got to have the understanding and the wisdom, you know, to have this information, which is why I titled this tonight, Do You Understand Palm Sunday? Because most Christians don't. Most Christians, Resurrection Week is no big deal. It's, it's just going by the wayside. Easter is nothing, you know, nothing except another opportunity to get candy and a bunny, you know, and we're doing the same thing or have done the same thing to Easter, that has, that, which is why I love to call it Resurrection Sunday, for it to be revived, to get away from the secular piece, as we've done at Christmas time. And we want to do something about that as well, which we just talked about four months ago. Okay, verse 17. Therefore, the people who were with him, with Jesus... When he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. Now we know Mary and Martha. We know this is John chapter 11 uh, where Jesus raised Lazarus uh, from the dead. Jesus had been away and it took four days for him to get there. Lazarus was in grave to him. He was buried. He was already starting to stink and Jesus shows up. And we know that Jesus calls Lazarus out specifically and Lazarus comes forth and they take the grave clothes away from him and Lazarus walks away 
healed and raised from the dead by Jesus Christ the Lord. And so that they, these folks have began to bear witness. So John gives us a greater understanding of some of those people that were around Jesus and witnessed him riding in on the donkey's colt. And that John gives us an understanding that there were folks there that had saw Jesus raise someone from the dead. But you know what, church? You can witness even a miracle. But that doesn't mean you're a true believer. You can witness someone's life change before your very eyes. But that doesn't mean you believe. The old saying, well, seeing is believing. Well, you know what, church? Seeing is believing that can lead someone to have faith in Christ. But there are a lot of people who believe. There are a lot of physicians today who are seeing miracles and it blows them away. I was just in the doctor's office not too long ago with one and they simply said, I don't know what happened, but uh, your, your lungs are starting to clear up. And I have no idea how that happened. And I told him, I said, no, Doc, I believe in the power of prayer. We believe in the power of prayer. And we believe God is bringing forth healing of this person who's making a change in their life. And, you know, but the, that doc, you know, must have, you know what his response was? It must have been a poor x-ray. They're only about 85% accurate. Church, that's, that's, that's what's happening. So sometimes seeing is not believing. Sometimes, and even, you know, even folks that, that claim to know Christ, it's not enough for them to take up their cross, which we're going to talk about here in just a few moments. Okay, verse number, uh, verse number 18. For this reason, the people also met him, met Jesus, because that they had heard that they had done this sign. So people were coming out. Jesus did a great miracle before that triumphal entry. He had raised Lazarus from the dead, and this drew great attention. And this for great attention, and I believe, church, as God's Holy Spirit moves forth, God's going to, I believe he's going to fill this place Amen. with people that are just curious for, for what's going on. Yeah. But you know what, church, just because we have 250 people here doesn't mean it's 250 Christians or disciples of Jesus Christ. Somebody asked me today, Pastor, why do you always give an opportunity to come to know Christ? You never know who's out here. I don't care if it's 30 people or 300 people. We want to give an opportunity for someone to come to know Christ. You know, and God, and sure enough, people were coming to know Christ today. People were recommitting their life to Christ today. People were, were, were changing, and, and God is just moving in people's lives. And we need to pray for them because those babies in Christ, you know, we have to follow up with them. We have to disciple them. You just can't let them go. You just can't just because you have a baby, you know, you just don't let them jump off the diving board. Say, well, they, they've, got the little, they've got the little safety things. They've got a noodle in their hand. That little baby's going down. You've got to be there and nourish them and, 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 and feed them, praise the Lord. You know, you just can't say, well, they're learning to eat. You know, little Emmett, he can eat himself, but he can't go in and make a meal for himself. At least you can't say, well, uh, he knows how to eat. You know, he can, he can chew it up real good now and everything. He's one year old. You still got to make him the meal and put him in a little seat and put like five bibs over him because, you know, children are messy and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, you still got to prepare the meals because he's one year old. You can't say, well, he can, but he, you know. And it's the same thing spiritually speaking. And there's a lot of time that goes forth into that and nourishing that, that babe in Christ. You know, so please pray for that. But here, Jesus, you know, he, 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 for this reason, people were coming out to see the Lord, curiosity, you know, and, and some of them, you know, just got in on the fade or the fad and they just started shouting Hosanna and all that kind of stuff. Just like a sports fan, just catch whatever win, whatever team is winning, just get on that bandwagon. Well, church, getting on that bandwagon is not going to take you to glory. You have to have Christ in your heart. You got to have Christ in your heart. And that's, and that's what's real. And, and I pray that you understand that. I pray that you understand that. You know, I really, really do. Verse number 19 says this. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The Pharisees, because they have been trying to conspire to kill Jesus. They have been trying to get him into trouble. They were, see, look, he's, setting traps, just like the governors in Babylon tried to deceive Daniel and, uh, you know, get him thrown in the lion's den. The Pharisees were trying to do the same thing to Jesus, you know, and to, to just set him up to fail. Have you ever been around somebody and you thought they were setting you up to fail? They were just baiting you. I've been around those kind of people, you know, and, and sometimes you don't realize it till it's too late. But Jesus, he's God. He knew what was going on. He knew that his hour was at hand. 
He knew what was taking place. He knew that, that his life was about to end, you know, uh, there on the, the cross. But the Pharisees, look, we're accomplishing nothing. The world is going after him. Now, you have to know that the Pharisees, they don't have the discernment of God because they didn't have God in, in their spirit, you know. Their body wasn't the temple of the Holy Spirit. They didn't realize that the worship was superficial. They didn't realize that the worship was not coming from the heart and sincere and great sincerity. They just saw the outward expression of what's going on. And church, there are people that see the outward expression of what's happening here. Our local sheriff, the local select board, uh, these other things. But I'm sitting there thinking, they think everything's going great. I'm saying, wow, will you look at my schedule? Will you look at what our folks are dealing with? Just because there are a lot of cars out there doesn't mean everybody's living on the hallelujah side in here. There are things going on. There are spiritual battles that are taking place. There are folks that are, that are in the front lines. And unfortunately, there are those that have even blasphemed the Holy Spirit and turned away from their faith. Okay, and just like in the movie God's Not Dead, where all those atheists, you know, on the board there at the beginning of the movie, and, and to think, and this is very true, all those atheists were one time devoted Christians. It's researching. All those atheists and, and all those great minds, but they turned their back on Christ. You know, including the teacher of that movie. Those that haven't seen it, I won't share anymore, but it's very historically accurate. It's also very accurate when it comes to how one's life works. But I was, I was sharing with the, 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 our county sheriff, Sheriff Gallant, you know, and, and he was very complimentary of the church. But I said with him, I said, Sheriff Gallant, what I long to see is when people's hearts start changing from the inside out. And I start, rather than hear calls of anguish and pain, people start to call with the testimonies of the Lord. And people begin to start to call and say, Pastor, I am victorious in Jesus' name. I have been delivered. I have been set free. And rather than, uh, you know, I pray that the only cries of, of anguish and pain are from new believers, you know, and that we are going and we are maturing and we are, we are being victorious. Because, church, if we're not living victorious lives, we can't be a disciple. We can't witness because we're a constant need ourselves. And I know God wants to set us free. I know He wants to deliver us. You know, so we have to be real careful because the outside, it may look like everything's going great. But you know what? This building's not the church. We are. And how we live and how we worship, which is a lifestyle. Worship is key. And the Pharisees, they were looking at the outside piece and they declared there, look, the world has gone after him. Jesus wasn't buying it. Jesus knew that wasn't happening. Jesus knew that in just four and a half days they would be crucifying him. Jesus knew that one of his disciples, Judas, would betray him. Jesus knew that in the last hour when he's praying that his most faithful disciples would catch a snooze in the garden while he's up there praying drops of blood and that they would not be there, that Peter would deny him. Jesus knew what lied ahead. Jesus knew that, 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 you know, that he was going to be killed you know, by Romans, but the, the Jews as well as everyone else would just stand by and let it happen because of his, the Father's great love for us. Jesus had to fulfill what was prophesied to wipe the slate clean because of our sin and to wipe us clean of that. But verse number 20, and this is the part that most people don't understand or grasp. Verse number 20, now there were certain Greeks among those who came to worship at the feast. So as Greeks or Gentiles, your translation may say, uh, were coming in uh, to worship there at the Passover. And they came to Philip. You know, we know Philip, as, as most believe this is Philip, of course, one of the disciples of the Lord, who came from Bethsaida of Galilee and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. These, this, this Greek man wanted to see the Lord, and I'd want to see him too. He just raised up Lazarus from the dead. Other people were shouting, he had just ridden in on a donkey's coat. You know, other, how did you ride that new donkey who never had any training? How did you do that? You know, well, he wanted to see Jesus. And so Philip says, what do I do? Verse number 22, so Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew is Peter's older brother. And in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Philip, you know, uh, Philip wanted, to, wanted some accompaniment. What do I do? Well, he goes and gets Andrew, who was an older fisherman, of course. And they both went to, to, to get Jesus. Verse 23, but Jesus answered them saying, 
The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. You better believe it got real quiet at that moment. Jesus, he wasn't in the mood to answer questions. Jesus wasn't in the mood for any more praise. My hour is at hand. And if you study the Gospel of John, you know, or the other Gospels for that matter, that Jesus declares this over 30 times, that the hour has not come yet. And he would sneak away. He would sneak out the back. He would sneak through the crowd. But now he's saying, the hour is at hand. The men did a great job this morning, didn't they? For our disciples did a wonderful job, you know, of portraying, uh, portraying that triumphal entry to King's reception. But I told the brothers yesterday at our last practice, I said, guys, our hour is at hand. We can't just say, well, it's two weeks away, it's three weeks away. It's showtime. Here is Jesus. He's declaring the hours at hand. What hour? The disciples, we already learned, they didn't understand until after. Jesus was glorified after he was resurrected. They didn't put the pieces together. They had the facts, but there was no understanding. There was no application. Here Jesus says to them in verse 23, And to the Greek men, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now it's very interesting. Jesus defines himself here as the Son of Man. He defined himself over 12 times in the Gospel of Luke as the Son of Man. Jesus here is, is defines himself not as the Son of God, not as the Son of David, but the Son of Man. Why is that? Because Jesus was proving his deity in this moment. That yes, he was born of a virgin, conceived of the Holy Spirit. When he bled, just like, if we bled just like we do, we go bleed red, Jesus bled red. Okay, Jesus would go through that pain. It is the Son of Man should be glorified. What he is doing is he is proving his deity in the last hour, which goes along with this morning's message. Verse 24, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Who is Jesus talking about? He's talking about himself. He's about to die. But out of dying, he's going to bring life. Church, I have life tonight. Why? Because the Lord died for me on the cross. And he knew that out of his death would bring much life. It would bring victory over hell. We're going to study that Saturday night at prayer meeting. What was Jesus doing after he died? He went to hell and conquered it in Jesus' name. He went before, you know, the uh, psalmist, uh, uh, King David declares that the Lord, he went to hell and told Satan basically, hey, what? I win. You are going to be defeated. I'm getting out of this grave tomorrow morning, praise the Lord. And I'm going to live a glorified life, hallelujah, and sit at the right hand of the Father. Wow. That's victory, church. But here he declares, if, but if it dies, it produces much grain, praise the Lord. Jesus declared in John 17, as he was praying, he was only praying for current disciples or current believers. He prayed for future believers, the future grain that would come forth from his death. Guess what? That's us. That is us. Do you understand the significance of, of what Jesus is declaring on the first Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago of what was going on. And remember, these are his last words of his life. He's winding down. He knows things are going to happen quickly. Jesus didn't concentrate on that superficial worship. He didn't say, wow, Greek guys, thanks for coming here, man. I appreciate I heard you out there shouting Hosanna. I heard you out there saying, Son of God, Son of David, Son of Man. You know, I heard you out there. Thank you so much. The hour is at hand. I'm about to die. Wow. Wow. Things can change very quickly. Things can change very quickly. And we have to understand that, church. Even as we live in the last days and as we prepare for the second advent of Christ, as we prepare to be raptured out of here and the archangel blow that trumpet at the will of the Father and Jesus parts the eastern sky and gets us out of here after the dead in Christ shall rise and then those that remain will be caught up in the air. We have to be ready. Things are going to happen quickly. And church, we have to understand these pieces and these components of what's happening because everything that Jesus said would happen did. And we're going to find out Wednesday night that we need to be ready for his second coming. Jesus isn't coming back to die. He's coming back to judge. 
The Bible declares that, God. We have to be ready for that. Young people, be ready. You know, we adults, be ready. Seniors, be ready. It might not be your death that takes you out of here. We need to be ready. I get excited singing about heaven songs. But church, I pray everybody's here is ready to go. And don't think that the adversary can't get you because he's trying to seek, kill, and destroy you. You better have an understanding of this. Because the moment you think you're okay is when he's got a trap snared for you. And you can fall in it hook, line, and sinker. But here Jesus continues to declare in verse 25, He who loves his life will lose it. Now church, we're studying this in extra innings. And, and the devotional Tuesdays at 10, I would encourage you to come out. Jesus declares this verse many times as well through his ministry. But the fact that he would declare it at the end is very important. It is very important that Jesus is talking about losing one's life. The fine life. See, church, when, if we understand what Palm Sunday signifies as the deity of Christ is recognized on the road to Jerusalem, we have to understand its importance. If we have to understand the importance of worship in the Lord in spirit and in truth, and not some superficial or artificial or non-genuine worship, but to be sincere. Jesus said, hey, he who loves his life in it, I'm sorry, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Church, what Jesus is saying here is, is that we need to die to the things of this world and live for Christ. Amen. That's what eternal life is all about. In extra innings, we're learning that we're not, we just can't be superficial Christians. We have to be disciples. We have to know what it means to confess Christ as Lord. Not just buy a little fire insurance to keep you out of hell, but to be a disciple and to look at these radical verses that Jesus was explaining. And he's explaining this right after he got off the donkey. He's explaining this right on that first Palm Sunday. You can't get any more clear of how important this is, where we surrender our life. Say, you know what, Lord? I hate the things of this world. I'm, not, I'm now about you. I'm now about living for you. So Jesus tells them, as Peter, I'm sorry, as Andrew and Philip are there, and the two Greek men are there, Jesus is declaring, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in, in this world will keep it for eternal life. Church, he who loves his life, you ready to lose it? If you love your life, you'll think about eternity where you're going to spend it. Do you want to see your loved ones? Only through the way of the cross. No other way. You can't put money in a bag. And, I, and, and you know, we, uh, we, when we lost our sister Jane in January, and we God blessed with, with a lot of money that came on her behalf, but a lot of that money was coming because people wanted, because of the purgatory piece that maybe that she's there that there's a way for us to get money on her behalf. Maybe that'll keep her from death. Church, that's sad, but many people believe that. The cards that we received, I read every one of them. And some of the things that were written in there. You know, and, and I'm thinking, wow, were they not listening at the funeral when we talked about faith in Jesus Christ and how that is and that he is the truth, the way, and the life. In the only way unto the Father. But some people don't believe that, unfortunately. But here Jesus said, he who loves his life will lose it. Jesus is talking about eternity. See, church, what Palm Sunday signifies is the dignity of Christ. But Jesus is finished talking about earthly things. He's talking about heavenly things. He's talking about where one's going to spend eternity. And if one wants to spend eternity in Christ through faith, we have to be ready to lose our life, which is what the confession piece, every invitation I give, admit, believe, confess publicly. And confession is all about surrendering of one's will, laying down their life, and truly picking up life. And Jesus said there, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Verse 26, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. Jesus had explained that to the disciples. He explained that to the two blind men that he held, that he healed on the road from, uh, from Bethany to Jerusalem, or from, sorry, from Jericho to Jerusalem, and they followed him. Church, when I got saved, I had to make the decision, I'm ready to follow him, take up my cross, and follow him. Have you done that? You say, Pastor, yeah, I'm a believer, but have you said, okay, I'm ready to follow Jesus 
And by following Jesus, that means you follow his word, which is why we're trying to teach it and live it as much as we can. So every believer has an idea of the expectations of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. Wow, church, think about that, where Jesus is. That's what I want. Where Jesus is is where I want to be. That's where I want to be is where Jesus is, in the righteous place, in the holy place, sitting at the right hand of the Father. And then he goes on to say, uh, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my Father, will honor. Church, I want the honor of my heavenly Father. Do you? How do you gain that honor? By following after the Son, Jesus Christ. You know, there's nothing greater than to, as Solomon writes, you know, in Proverbs chapter 9, that if, a, if, the, if the son has the, the honor of his father, it's more valuable than precious gold and rubies. But if he doesn't, it's a shame to his mother. It's what Solomon writes in Proverbs, a very wise book, filled with wisdom. But church, if we want the honor of Heavenly Father, we have to follow after the Son. The S-O-N Son. Jesus Christ, the Son. We have to follow after His Word. Church, we just can't be cool and think, well, I came to the altar and I prayed a prayer. That doesn't cut it. I, at our pastor's meeting that we had Tuesday morning, one of the pastors, you know, we had a few pastors here at the union service last week. And I, they, they were asking questions about why I do salvation publicly. And don't you do just lift a hand and talk to the pastor, you know, and, and nobody never does that. I'm in 11 years of ministry, I've never had one person come to me and say, I'd like to talk to you about giving my heart to Christ. We have to seize the moment at that opportunity. And for someone to, as the Father reveals the Son, to respond at that hour, at that moment and step out publicly. But I share with these pastors, because they asked, he said, do you really believe that? I said, absolutely, I believe it. That's what Jesus did. That was the way of Jesus. And I want the honor of the Father. I want, I want our Father's blessing upon me. Because if you're not being blessed, the only alternative is to be cursed. You know, stagnation and complacency, according to the Word of God, is a curse. I don't want to be complacent, do you? I want to be following after the Lord. I want to be growing each and every day. Again, nobody's perfect. We're going to have bumps in, in the roads, but I want to be maturing every day of my life. I don't want to come to April 13th, 2015 and be in the same place I am tonight in my walk as I'll be a year from now. Matter of fact, I don't want April 20th to come and not be closer to the Lord than I am today. I want to be following after Him. And Jesus said here, if anyone serves me, Him, my Father, will honor. Church, I want to serve Jesus. I want to hear those faithful words, well done, good and faithful servants. I want to hear those words. And church, this is so important that we understand because this is Palm Sunday. This is what, this is what Jesus was doing as he was riding in on the donkey's coat, as he, was, as he was explaining what life was all about, as he was talking to these two uh, certain Greeks you know, who were there to worship and to talk to Jesus about raising Lazarus from the dead. You know, and he is there and Jesus is calling a spade a spade. Ask yourself the question, have you lost your life to Jesus? Are you watching the clock right now to see, man, i got to get home to that 8 o'clock game. It's Sunday night baseball. You know, or, or I've got this thing to do or I've got that thing to do. You know, or think about the books that are on your shelf, the movies that you watch. You know, the, you know, the time that you spend with the Lord. Praise be to God for Elizabeth's testimony tonight about devotion unto the Lord. What is your devotion like? Think about it. You know, is life devoted to the Lord? Think about your worship. Is worship a lifestyle? Did last week's message penetrate into your soul and infect the worship of your life? You know, as we talked about this morning in that illustration, one moment praising God, the next moment cursing out the bank teller. 
You know, so, you know, that could easily be me. If I got upset or my check bounced or, or they didn't put the right number and how would I respond? Or if I tried to cash a check and, and they wouldn't let me do it because I was in the black or in the red, I'm sorry. You know, how would you think about it? Where's your self-control? Where's your tongue? All these things are very important to what Jesus is talking about in serving him. Wow. Church, that thing that happened to me at the bank as I shared this morning with, uh, with my dad and, and I were on our way to a Little League game. You know, that happened, church, in 1990. I was 12 years old. What were you doing in 1990? You know, think about that. I was 12. Some of you weren't even born. I was sitting. 1990. You know, our teenagers weren't even born in 1990. You're talking about 24 years ago. Some of our adults here weren't even born in 1990. All right, so when you when you think about you know when you know things, but that's still very vivid in my mind as an unbeliever at the time, looking for a reason not to go to church, looking for a reason to put a black mark against the Lord and so-called followers of Jesus Christ. Church, I don't want that to be you. The only way to make sure that's not the case is that you have an understanding of what this day is all about. I want to keep reading a few more verses. Verse 27, as Jesus continues on. Now, and it says there, verse number 27, Now my soul is troubled. Jesus speaking of himself. And what shall I say? Jesus, after riding on the donkey, having the conversation, seeing what's going on, his soul is troubled because he knows the hour is at hand. He knows what's going to be coming. He knows what's going to happen and his soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have came to this hour. Jesus said, you know, Lord, I can't, Father God, I can't say that to you. That's why I'm here. I came to die. Jesus understood what was happening. But remember, he defined himself earlier as the Son of Man. We have to remember the, 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 the humanity of Jesus Christ. You know, that, that, you know, if there was any way for this cup to pass from me, we're going to study that on Wednesday night, you know, if there, and, and later on this week, is there any way, you know, for that cup to pass, but not my will, Father, but your will be done. You know, you know Father, am I to say that? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. So what does this mean for when it comes to Palm Sunday? Church fulfills a purpose that has pre been preordained since the beginning of time. Palm Sunday fulfills a purpose for who? For Jesus Christ and proving his deity. We're all about wanting a purpose in life. Well, here's Jesus' purpose, to die on the cross. After he has proved his deity and fulfilled the other prophets, such as riding in on a donkey's coats. Verse 28, he begins to worship his father. Father, glorify your name. Jesus, even church, this is something else about understanding the, the Palm Sunday. Jesus was always about fulfilling the will of his Father. Amen. Always. In the last hour. Anguished and pain. Jesus knew. Remember, Jesus is, 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 is human too. He, he bled. He had headaches just like us. And Jesus, you know, he, he viewed things just like us. Remember the song in the 90s? What if God was one of us? He was one of us. He knows exactly what it means to feel how we feel. Jesus went through loss. He went through heartache. His, his earthly father, Joseph, died when he was roughly 14 years old. He knew what it was like to raise all those brothers, and, and most believe he had at least two sisters. We know he had four brothers and two sisters, according to Mark's gospel, at least two sisters. But he came to this hour. What's he doing? He's glorifying the Father. Jesus is going to do genuine worship. Father, glorify your name. And then I love this part right here. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have been glorified. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Think about when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist and the Father spoke from heaven because he was well pleased in his son. Church, here is the same voice coming from heaven. I have both glorified it, referring to the Father's name, and will glorify it again. And I tell you what, church, the Father's going to be glorified one more time when he says, son, go get my children. And Jesus returns to this earth and raptures us and then he comes back seven years later at the end of the tribulation and reigns on this earth for a thousand years. The Father is going to be glorified. What is Palm Sunday about? The glorification of the Father. Wow. It's about the Father and the Father's will being glorified and Jesus being obedient. Jesus being submissive to the will of his Father. Wow. 
Wow, Je let me just get real serious, real theological with you here for a second. Jesus could have pulled a number that Lucifer pulled. Jesus had a free will. He could have pulled the same thing Lucifer pulled, the fallen angel. He could have tried, but Jesus did. To the very end, he was obedient to his will of his father. Amen. Think about a church that's Paul suddenly signifies obedience in the last hour. Think about it. Are you, are you ready for that type of obedience? Are you ready to glorify the Father? Remember what glorifies the Father? Worship and serving Jesus Christ the Son and His ways. You know, I get attacked a lot for defending the ways of God. But church, let the attacks come because I'm backing up the Lord and He's going to back, no weapon is going to prosper that's formed against me. I'm backing up the Word of God. I can stand in this pulpit here tonight and declare to you, I'm excited to defend what Palm Sunday is all about. Amen. This is more than a, a palm branch tickling somebody's ear. Church is so much more of this. The question is, do you understand it? Is it making sense to you? Verse number 29, Therefore the people who stood by and heard it, and it said, and it thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Wow, now the Father is speaking and others are hearing. And this is genuine stuff right here. Notice this didn't happen when the people were glorifying Jesus and worshiping Jesus. There wasn't nothing happening. Why? Because it wasn't genuine. It wasn't from the heart. I believe, church, that God will send a mighty move of His Holy Spirit in this place. Not only at one accord, but when our worship becomes genuine. And I'm not talking about singing. I'm talking about our life. Our life is sold out where we have ourselves a, a Pentecostal move of the Holy Spirit, where, where God's Holy Spirit just begins to move. How does that happen? When our lives begin to be sold out to Jesus and to the will of his Father. Wow. That's when revival takes place. And I know we're not there as a church. I'll be bold to tell you that. I'll be bold to tell you that. I'm satisfied with where we are. We're doing too much, Pastor. We, you know, and, and we know you're not going to make everything. But church, I want our lives to be sold out to Jesus. I want us to be in the front lines declaring the good news for Jesus Christ. Whether we have 10 people here or 86 people like we had this morning, or we pack this place out with 250. I want to see God's Holy Spirit move wonderfully in amazing ways. Church, I don't want us to come up with these different reasons or, oh, me and God, we, he, he understands my shortcomings. That attitude... That's not worship with a lifestyle. What God wants to hear us is say, you know what, I'm cutting off the hand that's causing me to sin, Pastor. I got rid of my television today because I need to get closer to God, and I'm tired of Howard Stern having victory over my life. Amen. Yes. Pastor, will you come to, your house, come to my house because I know you have a truck, and I need to get this junk out of my bedroom underneath my bed. That's what God's looking at. Say, Pastor, well, I give him Sunday, and I... God cares about the secret place, too. Well, no, when no one else is watching, <coughs> defines how close you are to God. At midnight, when no one else is watching except God, defines how close you are to Him. When our attitude begins to look at that, I need to take an inventory, that's when revival is going to come. Because we want to glorify the Father. And then lastly, I'd like to read down through verse 32. Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me but for your sake. Wow. My younger brother, Darren, he used to love to say growing up, that deserves a wow. Jesus didn't even want the worship and honor from his father. All he cared about was pleasing him. He didn't, have, he didn't, he didn't need to toot his own horn. He didn't, remember you guys remember wrestling in the 90s, a, a whip wrestler named Barry Horowitz? Remember him? Pat himself on the back. You know, that was, you know, pat himself. The Lord didn't need no pat on the back. He didn't need that. He said that that voice was for you. Palm Sunday. Wow. Think about it, church. It wasn't for my sake, but for your sake. Verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Church, we want to cast the adversary out of this place. 
We want to cast him out of the river valley. We want to cast this joker out of everywhere. Out of our homes, out of our schools. And we want to lift up the name of Jesus. And if we lift up his name, he's going to draw people in here. You know, people say, Pastor, how, how is your church growing? I believe it's not because of having the best coffee in town. You may notice we don't turn the coffee on in the morning. But you say, Pastor, if we can get more people, you know, free coffee and donuts out there, people will come. You know what? They'll come for coffee and donuts and leave too. They ain't going to stay. We deal with that dinner and movie night every week or every month. So that ain't going to happen. You know, so the, uh, and, 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 and that's, that's not what it's about. I know the Father is going to draw people in here as we lift up the name of Jesus. Palm Sunday is about lifting up the name of Jesus to the glory of the Father. The Father desperately wants to hear children of God declaring Jesus Christ as Lord. That's what He desperately wants us to hear and to say and well as to live out. And we're going to church the only way. His son was here Sunday night. I'm sorry, Friday night. And they said, Pastor, we came into your town and it was just like a dark spiritual cloud everywhere. Just on people's faces. Man, we were out there talking to people, hoping they'd come in, you know, and then they went over to Walmart and got a few things. And he said, man, this is, this is a tough area. I said, brother, I know. It's, been, it's how it was when I walked in here too 11 years ago. You can just see the repression and the hurt on so many people. I said, brother, we have a high suicide rate. We have a high suicide rate per capita in the state of Maine. We have a lot of folks that struggle with mental illness, we, especially with depression and schizophrenia. We have 68% of our population is single mothers and children. There's a lot of brokenness and pain. But you know what, church? You know what's going to run that pain out of town? It's Jesus Christ. I believe that. People say, why isn't it happening now? The responsibility lies with us. And our worship. What does Palm Sunday do? It signifies worship. It signifies that the Father can tell phony baloney and superficial worship from the real deal. He can tell that. He can tell that to where, you know, uh, worship in its sincerity will bring forth revival. I'm not talking about worship as far as singing a few songs. And we had great worship. I'm talking about worship as far as our life. And by losing our life to the things of this world, and truly gaining life as we follow after Jesus. Jesus wants us to be radical with him. He wants us to be uh, the real deal. And let me just read verse 33. This he, Jesus said, signifying by what death he would die. What brings life? Faith in Jesus Christ. He had to die. We're going to do a to be continued until Wednesday night at 6.30. But I tell you what, church. Before we can get to Wednesday night and the death of Christ, we have to look at the Palm Sunday piece. Think about it. Where's your worship? Where's your purpose? Where's your hope? Do you understand that the Father can see through superficial stuff? I want God's Holy Spirit to move up into this place with the sound of a mighty Russian Amen. Amen. Church, I want to see people come to know Christ all over this place. I want to see those that I spend hours counseling with and mentoring all week long to come in here and praise the Lord. Two people were here today, praise be to God. But I long to see where God begins to fill this place with folks that are just saying, I surrender all. My life no longer belongs to me. My life is sold out to Jesus Christ. If we can grasp that, we can grasp what Palm Sunday is all about. Proving the deity of Christ. Proving genuine worship. Proving that the Father can see through the real stuff and the fake stuff. And proving the reason that Jesus came in the first place, which is to die on that cross because of his great love and to wash away our sins. Jesus didn't come to live. He came to die. The question is now, do you understand it? Father God, we thank you for your word here tonight. Lord, I thank you for the people that are here tonight. Lord, I thank you for men and women, boys and girls, 
that come into your house to hear your word. Lord God, I've always believed that a great move of your Holy Spirit would come out of a, a setting where people just wanted more of you. Lord, and Sunday night is a great opportunity for that to happen. And Lord, I pray that we will get closer, closer to you each and every day. But Lord, ultimately, I pray that our lives will no longer belong to us, but to you. Hello, everyone. Thanks again for watching today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street in Rumford, Maine. I pray that this sermon has informed you as well as drawn you closer to a wonderful relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I would like to take this time to invite you to our Sunday services, Sunday school for all ages at 9 a.m., worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m., and we have something brand new, a men and women's study groups on Sundays at 5 p.m. Also, on Wednesday nights, we have family night ministry for all ages at 6.30 as well as the churches open Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 9 until noon with church office hours, as well as classes on Tuesday and Wednesday at 10 a.m. And then we, our food pantry is open on Thursdays from 9 until noon. Take care, and may God richly bless you, and feel free to check us out on Facebook at Praise Assembly of God. God bless you.